Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. For today's video, I have another edition of my series, Ask an Archaeologist, where I interview current working archaeologists all about their lives and careers and present it to you guys. Today, we are featuring Jordan Patrick, a current PhD student at Durham University studying medieval archaeology and who has worked in community archaeology and is currently working as well as a historical film consultant. Before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to my channel to help show your support and help me out with the algorithm. Also, if you could give us a thumbs up at the end of this video if you liked it, that would be very much appreciated. All right, guys, let's dig in. Welcome to the channel, Jordan Patrick, our, our latest uh, interviewee on Ask an Archaeologist. Welcome. Thank you for having me. It's uh, it's great. Uh, Jordan and I actually uh, connected through Past Preservers, which is a an organization that um, kind of promotes heritage TV and film presenters. So I met her in person for the first time in December, and she's gracefully agreed uh, to come and talk to you guys. So we're going to kick everything off today with starting at the at your beginnings um, of of many archaeological careers, which is what inspired you to study history at university. So I have had an interest in history since I was about seven years old. Um, my elementary education was slightly different than some people uh, may have had. I went to a school that was, you were like informal classes three days and you were homeschooled too. Hmm. Um, and one of the teachers at this kind of co-op school really brought history to life for her students. And she brought out kind of replica artifacts. And then she even created a mini dig on the side of the building that we used for wow. school days. And we all had to go out there with our rope and we each got a square and we had to draw what we found. And it was just, it was so impactful that <laughs> it's brought me to the field all these years later. Mm -hmm. um, I actually went into college, not as a history major. I changed my major five times before I finally settled on history. <laughs> I initially went in as an elementary education major based on this teacher, you know, impacting students. I wanted to do something similar. Found out that uh, I wanted to be a bit higher up. So uh, university teaching was a bit more my, my speed. <laughs> there was a history professor at my undergrad who is like a mentor to me. And I remember sitting in his office, just looking at his books on the shelves. And we got to talking about Celtic archaeology um, and early medieval archaeology. And I expressed how interested I was in it. And he questioned why I wasn't pursuing that as a career path. And I kind of just looked at him and went, I, I don't know. I never <laughs> considered that I could do that as a career. I just saw it as a passing hobby and interest. Um, you know, I think archaeologists are people we see on documentaries or in, you know, media like Indiana Jones and Laura Croft. And sometimes we don't really see it as, oh, I, I could do that as a job. And so he knew a professor who knew a geologist who helped run a field school, put me in contact with them. And I ended up at a field school in Ireland and I've had the digging bug ever since. <laughs> Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's also really interesting as well, what you're saying about the archaeology and how it gets like pitched to people as a career, mm -hmm. because like, even if people are like, yes, you can do this as a career, there's always like a caveat of like, don't expect to make any money, don't expect to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's only a career that you can have if you like, essentially are like rich enough to have to not worry about money, which is ironic, because that's kind of <laughs> the origins of a lot of archaeology but that's also not really the case like there are plenty of archaeologists out there who have managed to get mortgages and live their lives and all that stuff without having like a very wealthy background going back to you I can tell from your accent you're not from the UK where we both no. currently live so uh next up what why did you come to the UK to study and what was it like studying at the University of Glasgow? I came to the UK because of love, love of two things. My now husband, who is a Scottish citizen, and my love of the Picts. So during undergrad, I got to study abroad at Oxford University, which was an amazing experience. And my tutor there had me write a, a paper on the kingdoms that were surrounding the Anglo-Saxon countries. And I found out about the Picts, and I was fascinated that I had gotten so far in my educational journey and had no idea that these people had ever existed. And I, I became obsessed. And so Glasgow actually at the time had a master's degree that wasn't just a generic medieval archaeology master's. It was a specific Celtic and Viking archaeology in that you can either choose the Viking path or you could do the Celtic 
path, uh, which included Pictish studies. Since I knew that was something I really wanted to specialize in, I chose Glasgow University. Staff and faculty at Glasgow are absolutely amazing. My program was quite small. The atmosphere at Glasgow was really, really encouraging. I did feel a bit apprehensive coming from a humanities background, coming from a history background, with my only experience in archaeology being that one summer of field school. But being in, in the environment at Glasgow was really, really, it helped boost my confidence. I have a wonderful tradition there where they have a lecture series that happens every Wednesday. And afterwards, all the students, postgrads, professors go to a pub, and it's a really informal place to talk. And it kind of takes away that bit of nerves to approach a PhD student yeah. or that's doing a postdoc or even the professors and be able to talk to them on the a less formal platform really really helped me with my studies and make me made me feel more confident makes you realize that like people are just people right yes yeah. <laughs> your professors want you to succeed even if yeah. you they, they're there to help you <laughs> yeah that's great what did you um do your dissertation on then for your master's so my master's dissertation was on the Pictish beast symbol mm. um, I wanted to look at it not from an art historical perspective, but more a scientific analysis perspective. So there was a theory I had come across that said the Gulsby Pictish beast was the prototype for this symbol, and that we see a de-evolution of the symbol from this one instance. My dissertation, however, followed a counter-argument that said that the Gulsby Pictish beast could not be the prototype because it's on an isolated piece of sculpture. It's not near any other higher complex symbols of the same type and due to the isolated nature most likely is not the prototype. So what I did is I did a breakdown of the distribution of this one particular symbol in the local area and was able to create kind of five different groups classifying it as higher complex to the least complex to propose where perhaps this school style might have originated rather than cold speed. So finished your master's and then yes. you went into the world of work and you started working at Archaeology Scotland, which is, uh, is it, is it a, technically a charity? It is a charity. Yeah, it's yes. a charity. So it's a, it's a charity based in Scotland and it, it helps mm -hmm. a lot with community digs and community engagement. So mm -hmm. not the typical like commercial archaeology, like private archaeology that like myself, and I think a lot of people tend to get into um, mm -hmm. right after university. So can you tell us a little bit more about what it was like and how you got into that? I got really lucky right off the bat. I actually got an admin position at the charity for their office. And because they knew I had field experience, if they're ever short on staff, they would send me out onto different community digs to help out. After I graduated and I was no longer on my tier four limited hours, I mean, I was able to work full time. I was able to get involved in a lot more projects and eventually worked my way up to project officer. I started my PhD shortly after that. But I was there for I want to say four and a half, five years mm -hmm. working in the community archaeology field, which I'm very passionate about. My field school that I learned at was also community archaeology based. I kind of mentioned before where I had this kind of instinct where I liked teaching, but I wasn't sure what age range I wanted to, to reach. I'm working with a community and teaching them what's in their own you know, backyard and how to help preserve that and promote that and give them a sense of pride mm -hmm. in heritage and what's local. And also a way to help with historical tourism as well. You see a lot of these small towns have a lot of fantastic historical bits and they don't know how to utilize them or mm. how to write up, you know, information boards or things like that. So Archaeology Scotland's great in helping different communities learn how to write grants and get money to help support and preserve these these different locations and sites, as well as help boost, boost the local economy. So you mentioned they're deciding to go get your PhD. So yes. tell us a little bit more about why you decided to to take that leap. And then you can also tell us a little bit more about your the focus of your research on you. To be honest, I think there's a little bit of ego. If a PhD student tells you if there's not a bit of ego, they're lying. <laughs> but really why I decided to go after my PhD is research is just my joy. I am a full-on nerd. I love spending hours digging into books pulling up excavation records, just, it's a bit like a mystery to me. I've always loved mystery since I was a kid mm -hmm. and trying to piece different things together and look at things from a different perspective and trying to get your own interpretation on things. The topic I'm doing is I'm looking at using non-invasive, non-destructive forms of technology, such as 
portable X-ray spectroscopy, RAM and spectroscopy, and using 3D modeling to uncover hidden traces of medieval paint on pre-conquest sculpture. It's talked about a lot more that Greek and Roman sculpture was brightly colored and painted, and it's not so much talked about that early medieval sculpture mm -hmm. was brightly painted as well. Especially in the UK, there's not a lot of examples that are left due to Reformation, the Victorians taking wire rushes and really cleaning the sculptures really well. But with, with advances in technology, we're able to have a new look at these sculptures and in a non-invasive way. So it's great for museums, it's great for churches, and that's actually what I'm doing right now. I'm traveling around. So the topic actually arose from me being a bit frustrated with interpretation boards and certain mm -hmm. museums and out on roadsides uh, with Pictish symbol stone. And it would show the Pictish stone half painted and half as we see it now. And coming out of my dissertation, obviously studying these standing stones, I couldn't find a single publication that discussed where these interpretations were coming from, why they were using the color scheme they were. Mm. And I was listening to, to uh, another mentor of mine and he eventually got fed up of hearing me complain and said, well, then go do it. Go do the work and yeah. publications that you're looking for. So that's really, that was the push that made me go, all right, I'm going to do this. <laughs> the bulk of my material is is from Anglo-Saxon England. Like I said, they're all pre-conquest. Before England, we see as a whole uni unified country. Yeah. So they are from different kingdoms. You've got, you know, Northumberland and Essex and Kent and all these different regional differences. So I'm really interested to see if there's different trade going on between artisans are we seeing traveling artisans is pigment palette different in different areas finding a lot more questions than answers at this point in the research which is I think quite normal yeah I was gonna say I think I feel like that's quite a theme to PhDs <laughs> yeah <laughs> delving away from that a little bit as I mentioned at the beginning um we met for the first time back in December and you were telling us about you have a bit of a side hustle working as a historical consultant for film and TV, which I really want to hear more about. That's really interesting. And to think that that's like a, a job description that I've not really come across before. Like, you know that these people exist and they work on films, but I, I've never met anybody who's done it before. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Like, how did you get started and whatnot? Absolutely. I mean, we kind of touched earlier on how archaeology financially can be a bit risky of a yeah. job gone. And being a PhD student, there is very limited jobs that I can take on due to contract purposes. I love a good historical fiction piece. I like watching Vikings, Last Kingdom. Mm -hmm. I, a lot of historians and archaeologists struggle to watch shows like that. I think because I know they're fantasy inspired by history, I can, I can take it with a grain of salt and appreciate it for what it is. And one day I was just like, I'd love to do that job. How great would that be? And I looked up who the historical advisor was for Vikings, found out he had a website that had an email, sent him an email just asking about his job, how he got started. Didn't expect a response at all because I was just a random student sending a random email. And he was very generous and he wrote a wonderfully long email in response. We set up a Skype meeting, gave me some pointers on, on how to get started. It's it's a lot of word of mouth. You've got to know people who then see your work, work with you and go, oh, I really appreciate this. I'm going to tell my friends that are working on pieces. The majority of my work so far has been working with script writers. I will read their treatments, their scriptments. They tell me what level of history they like in it. Do they just want me to make sure there's no big gaps? Are they using a pistol when they're, you know, their, their script Those is set? Tools. Like, yeah. tree or... And then others want really, really specific insight. They want to know what kind of clothing would my characters be wearing? I've, I had a request once where what breed of sheep would they be interacting with? What? And, you know, 10th century England, Southern England, it definitely varies from client to client how intensive they want to go. I have my first full set kind of being on set for the whole production gig coming up soon. So I'm nervous, but very excited for yeah. that. What that involves when you're like on set for the day. Essentially what it's going to look like is me working with the costume department to make sure they have all the inspiration that they want, helping them with certain pieces and basically being at their beck and call if they have any questions on design. Same goes for set design, prop design. If the writers want to change something, or even if the actors have a question, like how would they hold this type of sword? Or, yeah. you know, I'm basically there for any and any questions they have. There's yeah. a 
prep work that's going to go into it. So I'll be working with these departments before we even arrive on set. So actually being on set will be the smallest portion of the job at that point. So are you having to like kind of learn absolutely anything and everything that you can about the period that this is set in beforehand? Yes, yes. So I try to take jobs that are around what I already know, which I have a base being that I'm also doing my PhD work, which is why I haven't taken on as many clients as I may like just to, to balance the workload. But I try and take pieces that are either as far back as I go uh, as kind of Roman Britain, and I'll go forward through most of the Middle Ages. That's really interesting because as well, I think it's interesting because obviously you are a PhD student, but the fact that you they're not expecting somebody who already has a PhD makes it like maybe a little bit more accessible in a way. And it is interesting because yes, you wouldn't think for film projects, obviously yours, you're having to do this particular one, you have to do a lot of extra research for it. But the mm-hmm. fact that you can have such like a broad spectrum of things that you can kind of talk about as an archaeologist, you're like, you just, you absorb so many things over your career. You're like a sponge. You've mm-hmm. taken this fact from this class and you've just taken on all of this stuff. And you, but at the same time, you're like, oh, well, I don't probably don't know as much as somebody who's done a PhD in this or whatever. But then when you actually yeah. compare it to the average person writing a script, you realize how much you can contribute. Yes, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, talking about scripts and things that people give to you what is like the craziest thing that you've had to like debunk or like say no that's completely wrong to somebody uh not breaking any any NDAs or anything really the worst one was either them having like a pistol dueling and it's like right that type of pistol wouldn't have actually been made or used until 200 years after Mm -hmm. uh, script is set or The most common one is this kind of media image of what a Viking man Mm. looked like. And there was one script that was set in like the 14th century and had this tattooed Viking pagan man set in England. And it was one of those where I'm like, well, actually, the Norse (laughs) assimilated by then. Most everyone was Christian. They would not have been tattooed up. So it's little things like that. Um, And again, the writers I've been able to work with have been incredible. They've taken on my advice and go, oh, I I had no idea. You know, I was going off what Wikipedia I was able to find. That's why these jobs exist for people, you know, like us as historians and archaeologists. There have been some jobs I've turned down because the content just really didn't align historically. (laughs) Someone coming and trying to be like, oh, the aliens did it. Yeah. Yeah, there's a few of those. (laughs) Or even though there's archaeological record of this happening, I don't think this happened at all. So I want to make a movie about how it didn't happen. And you're like, well, as an archaeologist, because I know the material cultures there, I cannot stand beside that. Moving on from your very exciting historical consultant stuff, going back to archaeology and field work, can you tell us your like best and worst field experiences? Best would be the field school that I worked at. Not only was I a student there, I returned there to be a teaching assistant the next summer. And if I had the time and the money, I would be on that site every summer. It's fantastic. If anyone's looking for a field school and you're interested in medieval archaeology, the Black Friary Archaeology Field School is where you should go in Trim, Ireland. The staff were amazing. The finds were fantastic. I opted to do what's called a homestay through the field school. So you stay with a local family. And I, I got to know the family really well. They became like my second parent. I can't remember what season they're on now. I know when I was there, it had been 10 seasons in and they were still uncovering beautiful stained glass. I know they found a wonderfully carved stylus for manuscript making. It's a a very wealthy, wonderful site to work on if you're interested in medieval studies. Hmm. All right, but then you have to do the worst experience. Right. So the worst experience wasn't because of the site. I worked on a Bronze Age hill fort. This was again in Ireland. It was in Athboy. Unfortunately, though, (laughs) the funding was very limited. So they had housed all of the archaeologists working on the site in these very inexpensive houses and the one I got put in I think there was like three rooms there was a bunch of us crowded in there probably a health and safety violation I don't know Mm. but there was no heat and no hot water when we were there and when you're in the rain and the Mm. cold 
you're digging in a trench all day, all you want is a hot shower and like a bowl of soup or something. Yeah. We had a wood burning stove. So all of us would hang our wet gear there to dry. But yeah, I would say experience wise, that was the most grueling. The people were lovely. Um, I enjoyed the site, but yeah, I think, I think the worst part was just coming home with numb toes and fingers and not being able to have a hot shower. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's definitely like a required part of doing field work, especially, yeah, if you're doing it in the rain. Also, I can imagine just like how that place smelled if you were having to dry <laughs> was all not of your good. stuff over the wood burner. <laughs> we did not have visitors for a reason. <laughs> On that note, what is your favorite thing that you've like discovered or found while you've been working on a site? The best find I have personally excavated, I think would probably, I, some of the stained glass that I pulled up at the Black Friary. The site was unfortunately taken down a few years after the Reformation came and, and there was a lot of the stones taken away to build different buildings in the town. When a wall had been pulled down, one of the stained glass windows was nearly perfectly preserved. The lead, it was still in, inside the lead, which for this site was rare mm -hmm. uh, as it was used as an illegal dumping ground later, which meant while you were uncovering a medieval burial, there'd be bike spokes sticking <laughs> As all the dirt and layers had just shifted with all the chocks coming on years after years. But this this window was stunning. I think uncovering something and see, being the first person to see it after so many years mm. is an honor. And that particular piece, actually, we had the National Museum in Ireland came out and they kind of helped finish fu fully excavating it to take it away and preserve it. My channel is all about inspiring the next generation of archaeologists and giving people, you know, the tools quote unquote, <laughs> that they need to kind of build a career in archaeology. Uh, so in that vein, what advice would you have for someone to follow in your footsteps? Don't be afraid to reach out to people in the industry, to professors, to departments. I think a lot of young students are expected to know exactly what they want to do at such a young age. It's a lot of pressure. I mean, like I said, I changed my major five times. And I recently got to speak at my old high school and one of the students asked, how did I know when I found what made me happy, what job made me happy? And I had to tell them, honestly, I was like, it's trial and error sometimes. You've got to put yourself out there and not be afraid of rejection. I think there's such a fear of failure in our culture that it can be seen as a negative thing mm -hmm. instead of a way to grow. Like I said, my job as a historical consultant got started started because I sent an email not expecting a response mm -hmm. he could have easily just sent it into the delete folder or it could have gone in the spam folder but it, the answer is always no if you don't try and more often than not people in this industry want to share their knowledge with you mm -hmm. they want to succeed they want to share it because it is their passion because it's their joy they want to pass that on to other people so if there's something you think you're interested in or you want to volunteer contact the people in charge let them know you're interested. Even if if people are in the States, I didn't know this, a lot of counties have archaeologists that work for the government. As an undergrad, I got to work with the local county archaeologist, and I just volunteered my time. And it may be menial work, but at least you get to hear their experiences and learn from them. That's about it for the, the interview portion of this today. Mm -hmm. Thanks again for coming on. If uh, people are interested in you and following your journey, seeing more about the results of your research and everything, tell us a little bit more about where people can find you. Yeah, so I am on Twitter, Instagram. I will soon be on TikTok. And I use the same name for all of those platforms, Archeo Jordy. Jordy with a Y, not an I. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're interested on following my historical consultancy business on Facebook, that is JP Historical Consulting. When I'm able to post, you know, not in contract things, there'll be occasional fun glimpses of that. Most of the times it's archaeology memes or history memes. So all of your valuable content. content. Follow that Facebook page as well. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on and uh, I look forward to hearing more about uh, what you're doing and what projects you're going to be working on. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, guys, that's it for today. I hope that you have enjoyed learning all about Jordan's career and research. I know that I certainly really enjoyed talking to her and I look forward to getting to know her better and seeing where her career goes in future. Don't forget to go follow her on Twitter, Instagram, perhaps TikTok at Archeo Jordy. And while you're on Instagram, feel free to give me a follow there as well at rachelaman.com. 
days. Thanks so much for watching everyone and I'll see you next time. Bye.